second chapter, verses 21 through 35. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, for every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary <coughs> under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul, too. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Will you please be in spirit of prayer? Loving and gracious God, help us now to understand this scripture and help us to receive the word that you would give to us, to each one of us this day. May the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be pleasing and acceptable to you. O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. During his tenure as the head football coach at the University of Arkansas, Lou Holtz once had a, his team play a bowl game on Christmas Day. And when a reporter asked him how he felt about that, playing football on Christmas Day, rather than spending the day at home with his family, Coach Holtz was honest and to the point. He said, well, frankly, I'd rather be doing this. <laughs> Once you've been to church, had dinner and opened the gifts, Christmas is the most boring day of the year. <laughs> so the question for us today is, is there life after Christmas? Or is Lou Holtz right? Is there anything to do? Anything to look forward to once the big day has come and gone? Or is the aftermath of Christmas merely, as New Holtz might say, the most boring time of the year? Well, it's not uncommon to feel a certain left out after Christmas. We even do this in the church. After all, what is the slowest, lowest, and most anticlimactic Sunday of the year. Well, if it isn't the Sunday after Easter, it's surely the Sunday after Christmas. Traditionally, on this day, worship attendance plummets. Look around. <laughs> and the energy level that we have during Advent seems to dissipate as well. It's as if we collectively use this time to rest to catch our breath and say, Whew, Christmas is over. Thank God that's done with. Now we don't have anything to worry about until Easter. <laughs> Parents, however, of newborn babies know otherwise. When the child is safely delivered, yeah, the mother relaxes in exhausted happiness, and the father beams with pride and passes out cigars after the birth, but that respite only lasts 
for a moment. Now that the baby is here, she needs food and warm clothing. She needs love expressed in a close embrace, and soon she will need to have her diapers changed for the first of many times. Lest we forget, newborn babies quickly remind us with their numerous needs that our lives as parents have only begun. Unfortunately, we have this morning's text from the Gospel according to Luke to give us the same lesson with respect to our lives as Christians. We may wonder if there is life, or at least life in the church, after Christmas. But our text shows us that for Joseph and Mary, their religious life goes on. Besides all of the familiar parental duties, Mary and Joseph also attend to their religious duties in the days following Christmas. They have Jesus circumcised eight days after his birth. That's the law of Moses' commands. Again, according to the law, Mary undergoes the rite of purification, since mothers are considered ritually unclean after the birth of a child. Then, after proper time, Joseph and Mary present Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem, where he is dedicated to God in accordance with the scripture. They also offer their temple sacrifice of either two turtle doves or two pigeons, which the law allows as a substitution for poor families who cannot afford a sacrificial lamb. So four times in this short text, Luke tells us that Joseph and Mary perform their religious duties according to Jewish law and as the law requires in the aftermath of Jesus' birth. As it does for us today, life goes on after Christmas for Joseph and Mary, including worship and the practice of their faith. And they did this all the time, not just on one or two of the most holy high days of the year. They and we, all of us who are here today, are to be commended for that. We're not just C and E people, right? Christmas and Easter, but you're here today as well. So I commend you. And even as Joseph and Mary are fulfilling the law at the temple, they meet an old man named Simeon, who speaks from the Holy Spirit in words which comfort and disturb, revealing the scriptural significance, spiritual significance of this baby, that this child's life will go far beyond the observance of religious rituals. Simeon promises that this newborn baby, who looks so helpless and vulnerable and unassuming right now, will someday grow up to be a unique man with a singular destiny for all people. By the word of this child, those who are proud and convinced of their worthiness in God's sight shall fall. For those who are poor in spirit and who know their need for God's mercy shall rise and receive the kingdom of heaven. Because of this child, and all that he means, those who are happy, who seem to have everything going their way in this world, shall fall. But those who are born shall rise and be comforted. Those who are privileged and arrogant in power, who swagger through society, scattering lesser mortals before them, and making self-serving rules for others to live by, shall fall. For those who are meek shall rise and inherit the earth. Those who are complacent about all that is wrong in the world, who tolerate injustice and unrighteousness in the name of immutable laws of human nature, shall fall. For those who hunger and thirst for what is right shall rise and be filled. 
those who commit the obscenity of war, use instruments of destruction against their neighbors shall fall, while those who are peacemakers shall rise and be called children of God. Those who bask in the glory and honor of popular acclaim, who lead respectable lives in conformity to the expectations of culture, shall fall, while those who are rejected and persecuted for righteousness' sake shall rise and enter the kingdom of heaven. This child shall grow from his roots with the Spirit of the Lord upon him, and with all his counsel and might, he will not judge as the world judges, by what the eyes see and the ears hear. He will not judge the worthiness or usefulness of others by their wealth, their power, or their standing in public opinion polls. He will not judge as a profiteer or a politician would judge, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He will judge by God's standards, not the world's standards. And therefore, many who expect to rise shall fall, and those who expect to fall shall rise. As Jesus said, the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. In the final analysis, declares Simeon, this child will become a man who, de who causes the inner thoughts of many to be revealed. He will become a dividing line, and a dividing line by which lives are tested and hearts are revealed. By his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus will present to each of us the only essential choice that we must make in life. Will we go against the grain of worldly convention to follow our Lord? Or will we stay on the safe side of conformity? We reveal the thoughts of our hearts when we come down on one side or the other. Whether we perceive it or not, we reveal our inner thoughts all the time by every action that we take or that we fail to take. But we stop to help a stranded motorist or drive by and ignore that person's need, we reveal ourselves in ways more profound than we realize. We, when we speak callously of the poor or stand up to defend the poor, even when it is unfashionable to do so, we reveal ourselves again along with our values and the inner thoughts of our hearts. And this is even more true with Jesus. We can only choose to live for him or against him. We are either his disciple or his detractor. There's no middle way. And if we choose to be his disciple, we choose a set of principles and a way of life which Simeon knows are bitterly opposed by the world. And there's no mystery in this, nor is it a mystery to God or anyone else what choice we make. Our values, our priorities, and our lifestyle all reveal to God and to the world the content of our hearts and the character of our souls. Simeon comes along to remind us that there is indeed life after Christmas. The baby Jesus does grow up. He does fulfill his destiny for the falling and rising of many. He does become a sign which is opposed on earth even while pointing to glory in heaven. Now that he is born, Jesus reduces all our choices in life to one, to live with him or to live without him, to live as Christians in an alien land or to live as people who are conformed to this world. By this Sunday after Christmas, and it's the final Sunday of 2015. Can you believe that? Wow. 
But this is a good time to think about this choice, to reflect on what it says about the rest of our outward lives and what it reveals about our innermost thoughts and our hearts as well. Choose wisely. Amen.